Hello everyone. In my previous video, I had talked about the symptoms of the ear and the relevant questions that we should ask. Now in this video, I'll be talking about the no symptomatology and history taking. So the common symptoms with which the patients come to ENT OPD related to nose, they are nasal discharge, nasal obstruction, headache, sneezing, disturbances of smell, snoring, epistaxis, itching, and nasal crusting. So we'll see each symptom one by one. Now nasal discharge. So nas nasal discharge can be unilateral or it can be bilateral. Now for unilateral nasal discharge, it is said that if a child comes to ENT OPT with a unilateral foul smelling nasal discharge, then it should always be considered as a foreign body unless proved otherwise. And the causes of the bilateral nasal discharge, they are DNS, deviated nasal septum, then entroquinal and ethmoidal polyps, then allergy, that is allergic rhinitis. And if the in children, if the adenoids are enlarged, so they can also get infected and lead to nasal discharge. Then we should also ask regarding the character of the discharge. If the discharge is watery, it is seen in allergic rhinitis. If the discharge is transparent and clear fluid-like, it can be CSF rhinorrhea in which the CSF leaks from the nose. And if the discharge is mucoid, it, it is seen in deviated nasal septum. And if that discharge gets infected with uh, pus, it, it is seen in sinusitis. Now, if the discharge is blood stained, then it can be because of entroquinal polyp or rhinosporidiosis or any malignancy of the nose or paranasal sinuses. Now, rhinosporidiosis, it is a fungal infection of the nose in which granulation tissue is formed in the nose. And the fungus responsible for this is rhinosporidium seabury. So these three are the causes of blood stained nasal discharge. The next uh, uh, symptom is nasal obstruction. Now, nasal obstruction can also be unilateral or bilateral. So common causes of unilateral nasal obstruction, it can be a foreign body in the nose. Now, if the foreign body remains in the nose for a long time, that is, if the patient is not aware of a foreign body, then it can lead to the deposition of calcium and magnesium salts over it, which is called a rhinolith. So a long-standing foreign body, it can lead to the development of rhinolith. That is also a cause of unilateral uh, nasal obstruction then hypertrophic turbinates or if there is any growth or mass in the nose it leads to nasal obstruction and early stage of entroquinal polyp also causes unilateral nasal obstruction now when the entroquinal polyp grows in size it grows posteriorly and it involves the nasopharynx so once it is in the nasopharynx then this entroquinal polyp will cause bilateral nasal obstruction but in early stages it causes unilateral nasal obstruction then c-shaped dns now here in C-shaped DNS, the D, uh, there is DNS only in the one plane. So it causes unilateral nasal obstruction. However, if there is a long standing DNS, then it will lead to the hypertrophy, compensatory hypertrophy of the opposite turbinate, inferior turbinate, and then it can lead to the bilateral nasal obstruction. But initially in DNS, there is unilateral nasal obstruction. Now some causes of bilateral nasal obstruction, they are allergic rhinitis or vasomotor rhinitis, and ethmoidal polyposis. Now vasomotor rhinitis, it is because of the overactivity of the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, which leads to the congestion of the nasal mucosa. That is called vasomotor rhinitis. So in nasal obstruction, we should try to uh, see if there is unilateral or bilateral nasal obstruction, and uh, these are the causes of the nasal obstruction. The next symptom is headache. Now headache because of any nasal pathology can be either because of the parasinus involvement, that is infection of the paranasal sinuses, or it can be neural. Now in paranasal sinuses involvement, the headache will be present in a typical uh, area. So if there's maxillary sinusitis, the headache or the pain will be in the infraorbital region. If there is frontal sinusitis, the pain will be in the supraorbital region, However, this pain will have a characteristic periodicity. That is, it will start in the morning, then it will peak in the midday, and by evening it will fade off. So that is why sometimes it is also called office headache because it occurs during the office hours. That is a typical periodicity of frontal sinusitis pain. 
then if ethmoidal sin ethmoid uh, sinuses are involved sinusitis is there then the pain will be over the bridge of the nose that is between the eyes and in the sphenoid sinus involvement the pain is located posteriorly that is occipital region or vertic vertex region and sometimes it is also felt behind the eyes and that is retroocular region so by the area of the involvement we can get an idea that which sinus is infected then another cause of headache because of nose pathology is high dns which presses the middle turbinate and presses the anterior ethmoidal nerve so this will also cause cause uh, headache like pain in the uh, orbital region and near the nose so that is called sludder's neuralgia because it was discovered by uh, sludder or anterior ethmoidal nerve syndrome so a uh, headache because of the nosal pathology can either be because of the secondary involvement of the sinuses or uh, pressing of the anterior ethmoidal nerve then next symptom is sneezing now we know that sneezing is a actually it's not a symptom but it is a protective reflex and it is initiated by the abnormal stimulation of the nasal mucosa so that whatever irritant is there uh, it it is sneezed out however if sneezing is present paroxysmal bouts that is there are uh, say 15 to 20 sneezes at a time then it is seen in allergic rhinitis and patient will typically say that uh, in the morning when they wake up they have at least 10 to 15 bouts of sneezing and then it is called paroxysmal sneezing which is seen in allergic rhinitis then the next symptoms is the disturbance is in the smell now we know that the upper one third of the nasal cavity it is lined by the olfactory epithelium and that is responsible for the conduction of the um, smell sensation so the disturbance in the smell can be anosmia anosmia means complete loss of smell now anosmia can be either because of any obstructive pathology in which the there is obstruction in the conduction of the aromatic molecules and they are not able to reach the olfactory epithelium or it can be because of neural pathology in which the aromatic molecules reach the epithelium but because of the pathology in the nerve olfactory neurons or olfactory pathway the signal is not transmitted so the obstructive pathways which can cause obstructive conditions which can cause anosmia they can be polyps in the nose any mass in the nose then inflammation of the nasal mucosa that is rhinitis deviated nasal septum or atrophic rhinitis in atrophic rhinitis there is formation of crust in the nose so these crust block the nasal cavity and the uh, aromatic molecules they are not able to reach the olfactory epithelium so they lead to anosmia then it can be neural neural means we know that the olfactory neurons they pass the cribriform plate uh, and reach the brain so if there is fracture of the cribriform plate then there will be injury to the neurons olfactory neurons and it leads to anosmia similarly if there is any intracranial tumor then also it can lead to anosmia then another disturbance of smell is parosmia parosmia means distortion of smell sometimes called perverted smell it means the patient smells something else uh, rather than the actual smell of the substance so it is seen in intracranial tumor and uh, involvement of the olfactory neuron that is neuritis then next term is cacosmia cacosmia is feeling of the bad smell because of some internal pathology for example dental infection it can be malignancy of the nose or the paranasal sinuses or sinusitis or a foreign body in the nose so in all these conditions the patient will have a bad smell but the reason is inside the patient only that is called cacosmia then next term is hyposmia as the term suggests hypo it means decreased sense of smell so if it is because of age it is called presbyosmia uh, in the similar lines we can say like presbycusis that is decreased hearing because of age so this is decreased sense of smell because of age that is presbyosmia then in menopause also it is seen that uh, there is hyposmia in smokers also and if because of any condition radiation therapy is given to the nose then it leads to decreased sense of smell so that is hyposmia some other disturbances of smell can be hyperosmia that is increased sense of smell it can be seen in some neurotic persons in epilepsy 
in pregnancy and in cystic fibrosis. Then next term is phantosmia. Phantosmia means uh, there is no smell, but still the patient smells something. So that is actually a type of olfactory hallucination. Then olfactory agnosia. Olfactory agnosia means inability to recognize all order sensations when olfactory functions are intact. So here there is no problem with the olfactory pathway, but uh, the problem can be because of any other pathology in the brain, for example, in stroke. So that is called olfactory agnosia. Then heterosmia, in which all orders, they smell the same. That is called heterosmia. And osmophobia, in which the patient is phobic uh, uh, to certain smells. That is, he has a dislike for certain smells. That is called osmophobia. So whenever a patient presents with disturbances of smell, we should try to elicit which type of disturbance he is having by asking these uh, questions. Then next nasal complaint can be snoring. Now snoring means the patient makes sounds during sleep and these sounds, they are because of the vibration of the soft palate during sleep and especially in the uh, supine position. The common cause of snoring it can in children, it can be adenoids. Then uh, nasal polyps and hypertrophic turbinates can also be seen in adult patients. And uh, the, the treatment of snoring, it includes weight reduction and also in children adenoidectomy or tonsillectomy. And if there is any increased soft tissue in the upper airway, then radio frequency ablation of that soft tissue. And uh, one uh, surgery done for snoring, it can be UPPP, that is uvulopalatopharyngoplasty, in which the excessive soft tissue from the uvula and the uh, palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall, they are removed. So snoring can also be one of the presenting complaints related to nose. Then epistaxis. Now epistaxis means bleeding from the nose. So whenever a patient comes in the ENT OPD with bleeding, so we should first ask and inquire whether the bleeding is anterior or posterior. Anterior means coming from the anterior nostrils or posterior, it means the patient feels that something is coming in the throat, then we can see in the oral cavity and oropharynx that there is bleeding, that is posterior bleeding. And one of the very common areas of bleeding, it is a Littles area, which is also called Kieselbeck's plexus, which is situated in the anterior inferior part of the nasal septum. And it is basically an anastomosis between the branches of the internal and the external carotid artery. And uh, hypertension is one of the most common cause of bleeding in adults that is epistaxis in adults and uh, rhinitis and nasal picking. These are the common causes of uh, epistaxis in children. And in children, retrocolumular vein, it is the common uh, vessel which is involved in epistaxis. Then another area of uh, vascular area, we can say in the nasal cavity, it is the area of woodruff. It is a venous plexus, which is situated in the posterior end of inferior turbinate. So this is a cause for posterior epistaxis, while Littles area is a re uh, region for anterior epistaxis. Now, when we get a patient with epistaxis, so we should try to ascertain the etiology. Now, etiology can be either local causes, it can be focal causes, or it can be systemic causes. Now, local causes means there is any vascular pathology in the nose, for example, telangiectasis of nose in which the vessels are fragile. Then there can be trauma, though that trauma can be a physical trauma, it can be a chemical burn injury that can lead to epistaxis. Then in rhinitis also there is congestion of the vessels of the nasal mucosa that can lead to epistaxis. In rhinosporidiosis also uh, the granulation tissue can bleed. Then if there is any hemangioma or if there is any carcinoma of the uh, nose, it leads to epistaxis. Then focal causes. So focal causes either can be in the um, regions which are near the nose, that is in the nasopharynx, like adenoids in children, endocrinal polyp, or nasopharyngeal carcinoma, or in the paranasal sinuses. For example, if carcinoma of maxilla or juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So these are the uh, pathologies which are located near the nose, either in the nasopharynx or in the paranasal sinuses they can also cause epistaxis. Then there are some systemic causes which also lead to epistaxis, which can be blood coagulopathies like hemophilia or 
blood cancer like leukemia then multiple myeloma or some other systemic illnesses like hypertension liver disease because we know that vitamin k metabolism is hampered in liver disease it can lead to epistaxis then if the patient is on aspirin and other anticoagulants then he can also have epistaxis then high pressure and altitude if patient suddenly goes to such pressure and altitude he can bleed and if there is vicarious menstruation in which uh, um, the during the menstruation the female bleeds from the nose so these are the etiologies common etiologies of epistaxis and we should try to rule out these epi, uh, etiologies when the patient comes with epistaxis the next is itching in the nose now in itching in the nose it is most commonly seen in allergic rhinitis in which the other symptoms are the sneezing and the watery nasal discharge as we saw earlier now in in allergic rhinitis what happens the patient constantly rubs the tip of the nose with the palm so it gives an uh, impression that uh, the patient is like uh, saluting so sometimes it is called allergic salute this position that is called allergic salute which is seen in allergic rhinitis and then because of this repeated rubbing of the nose there is a formation of a dark line over the dorsum of the nose at this place which is called darier's line so allergic salute and darier's line they are features of allergic rhinitis and finally we see nasal crusting so uh, most common cause of formation of crust in the nose is atrophic rhinitis in which greenish foul smelling extensive crusting is present in the nose now here in atrophic rhinitis there is atrophy of the nasal mucosa and the bones so we have a rheumatic cavity but still there is nasal obstruction in spite of the rheumatic cavity and this nasal obstruction is because of these crust which fill the nasal cavity and in such patients uh, there is a term which is called merciful anosmia merciful anosmia means there is foul smelling discharge from the nose however the patient is not aware of this because he is anosmic because of the crusting and the neural involvement so that is merciful for him but it is very uh, irritant to the other persons who stand near that patient so that is called merciful anosmia which is a feature of atrophic rhinitis so we see that uh, these are the common uh, symptoms nose symptoms with which patients comes and we should try to ask the details of each symptom so that we narrow down our diagnosis thank you